Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD industry and other subject matter experts to explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. Now, to our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. And as a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. Now, this week, we're going to talk about space as a warfighting domain with General Kevin Chilton, who is the leader of our Mitchell Institute Space Power Advantage Center of Excellence team, or as we call it around here, MySpace. Sir, thanks again for being here. It's great to be with you again, Slick. So, sir, let's wind back the clock a bit. Uh, would you mind to tell us where you were in 2008 and a major event that took place, which really ties to our theme today? Yeah, you know, it's like, if I might, I'd, I'd, let me wind the clock a little further back to 10 years earlier, 1998. And uh, this was the year I returned to the mainline Air Force from NASA. And my first duty assignment was as the Deputy Director of Operations at Air Force Space Command Headquarters. And I remember uh, a close colleague, friend, in fact, classmate from the academy, who was the director of intelligence, Gary Lorenzen. He, uh, he came in and we sat down and chatted about what was going on in, in the intelligence world. And China had recently released a white paper that he showed me. Um, what I've learned over the years is that the Chinese oftentimes are very transparent about what they intend to do. Day to day, what they're doing, they may not be transparent about, but they will write and publish things. And so in 1998, this paper you know, essentially said, uh, we don't believe there's any way we would be able to compete force on force with the United States military, given their performance in uh, Desert Storm and Bosnia and Kosovo. And so our investment in our future is going to be in capabilities that will neutralize the U.S. advantages in areas like uh, electronic warfare, command and control, cyber, and space. And so they they even wrote about how they were going to try to disrupt what they felt were the things that made us so effective was our ability to quickly target and to command and control our forces to get them to the right spots, to have uh, GPS capability to guide our munitions over the rise in communications to guard our forces, and then the ability to, in our command centers, to use computers to mesh all this together and give timely orders. And so I found that interesting back in 98, and it actually started us, Gary and I, thinking about the idea of maybe we needed to have a I.O., information operations numbered Air Force, because we had these little pieces scattered around in the Air Force with regard to electronic warfare and collection and cyber. Uh, I think it was called computer networks defense at the time. And maybe we need to start organizing ourselves and start thinking about a future where these types of things were being held at risk. Well, um, I was there nine months and then I moved. And 10 years later, I came back in 2008 to your question and uh, this is when the the chinese now had become very active in the cyber domain we saw that Uh, of course they had made grand investments in their military but now they apparently wanted to go ahead and threaten another domain that we're so dependent upon and that would be space and they demonstrated that by launching an anti-satellite direct ascent kinetic kill anti-satellite weapon and destroyed one of their own satellites to prove they can do it. And we had watched them test this. They had tested it, I believe, two times and uh, either missed intentionally or missed. But the third time they did not. And uh, that, I think, was the big wake up call in 2008 that China meant what they said in 1998 and that they were willing to develop uh, capabilities that could hold our constellations at risk, the very constellations we so depend on, not just for our military, but for our society. Well, sir, that was over a decade ago. So uh, how have things evolved when it comes to adversary actions in space? Well, the Chinese have gone on to field that capability. So that was a demonstration test. So now they're poised to, to execute that. I'm not sure of the numbers. I'm sure we know, but it's classified. Uh, Further, they've invested in uh, directed energy, ground-based lasers. 
and other devices that can confuse, if not damage, or hinder the, the ability of our ISR satellites to collect. The Russians have done the same with regard to lasers. And so what we've seen is not a test in 2008 that they just put on the shelf, but they've moved forward. And I believe today pose a great risk to some of our key constellations, if not all of them. Well, sir, from from what I hear and read, China and Russia are the main drivers for this. What's motivating them? Well, I can't read their minds, but I, I think we can get a little insight by watching how Vladimir Putin's behaving in the Ukraine today. Uh, he's rattling his nuclear sword to try to keep our attention and try to deter us from increasing our engagement there in the defense of Ukraine. He's also rattled his anti-satellite sword just before uh, the invasion, he directed that the Russians demonstrate a direct ascent kinetic anti-satellite weapon, which they launched and destroyed one of their own satellites. And I'm sure that wasn't coincidental. I think it was to send a signal to the United States. This would be my assessment to, uh, again, don't think about interfering in what we're about to do in Ukraine. And then if you take a look at what uh, China is doing with their nuclear deterrent, uh, going from a small assured second strike capability to what would appear to be the development of a triad and a first strike capability. Now, I conclude that both of them are looking to wield these weapons, whether they be nuclear or anti-satellite, as uh, coercive elements of a strategy that would attempt to deter the United States from engaging even with conventional weapons in a contest in uh, Eastern Europe or uh, across the Taiwan Straits. So that's where I go with it. I'm sure there's others with other opinions, but we've certainly seen Putin wield these capabilities to send a signal in my view. So where does the U.S. stand on this? I mean, if China launched that ASAT strike in 2008, have we taken advantage of the subsequent years to update our space enterprise uh, to reflect the principles we see in other warfighting domains? Uh, no, <laughs> this, is, this is a simple answer. Uh, we've talked a lot about it. After that, we started talking about the need to build a resilient architecture that uh, could either be defensible or survive attacks like this and continue to deliver the space capabilities that we've come to enjoy in every other demand, air, land, and sea, not to mention uh, in our own economy back home. But we've talked a lot about it, but we refuse to recognize space as a warfighting domain for years after 2008. Indeed, it wasn't until the last year, I would say 2015, the last year of uh, President Obama's administration that after watching continued bad behavior by the Chinese, that we changed our policy to declare that we could talk about space as a warfighting domain. Before that, the commanders of Space Command, and this crossed multiple administrations, it's not a political issue, it was a policy issue that was sustained across multiple administrations. They were prohibited from talking about war fighting in space or space superiority or the domain being a war fighting place. Uh, and so I, I think we were laid out of the chocks or the starting blocks to react to the activities that the Chinese uh, demonstrated in 2008. We're talking a lot about it now, and we're talking about a lot of the same things. But as we were in our nuclear recapitalization and other some other areas in defense, we're behind, in my view. You know, when people heard about the stand-up of the Space Force, I think many folks just assume this sort of work was already done. What are the main focus reforms that you think need to occur? And let's start off with the super strategic level. Well, as I mentioned, I think we, we need to even though it was recognized in the policy document, we need to be talking about the fact that the domain is a potential warfighting environment. And it's, it's not surprising. Every commander or space command, I think back to when the command first stood up in 82, anticipated this. We didn't want it, but the adversary gets a vote and they voted that this is going to be a domain that people will conduct combat operations in. And if you stop and think about it, there hasn't been a single domain where humans haven't figured out a way to fight in, whether it be on the land, the surface of the ocean, under the sea, or in the air, now in space, and are equally in a man-made domain called cyberspace. So to make progress, you, you have to talk about it. You have to think about it. You have to start writing doctrine. You have to start thinking about grand strategies. And of course, you want to think about the end state first. 
And in my view, the, the, the appropriate end state is to deter an adversary from ever thinking that they could uh, eliminate our space capabilities. Or if they decided that uh, they wanted to take that risk, that we could assure them that we would eliminate their space capabilities and the fight would still be neutral, if not tipped in their favor. And so I think deterrence requires an offensive capability that would deny, you know, put place in the mind of the adversaries, the clear message that will deny any benefit that you'll get from attacking our constellations in space because we'll remove yours. And then I also support the notion of making more resilient and responsive types of satellites and more resilient and responsive uh, orbital domains or orbital positions. But we've been talking about that for a long time and we still haven't done it. And I think it's going to take a while to do it, frankly, because we've, everything up there is working just fine. It's just vulnerable. And to gear up the, the system to move forward is going to take some time. So I don't think this is something we should be doing serially. I don't think we should be serially developing first a defensive posture and then later an offensive posture. I think the quickest thing to do to put doubt in an adversary's mind is to develop an offensive capability while simultaneously working on the difficult task of redesigning essentially all the other constellations we have on orbit to bring us communications, GPS, weather, uh, missile warning, et cetera. So if we're going to understand the threat that really ties to the space domain awareness, uh, what are your thoughts on the improvement we need there? Well, there's some fundamental things that you need in every domain to be successful. Every soldier wants to know what's on the other side of that hill. Uh, every airman wants to know what's beyond visual range uh, approaching them. And every sailor wants to know what's hull down over the horizon and what are they doing? What is their intent? How can I target them and how can I defeat them should hostilities break out? And so, I, you know, it's, it's kind of table stakes. And in my view, in any domain, before you can start planning operations or executing operations or be effective in either the defense or the offense. So this is the same in space. Uh, we need improved space domain awareness. We call it space situational awareness in other domains. It, that's fine. We have a new name for it. But the objective of that is not only to keep track of what is in the domain, what's friendly, what's uh, adversary, what's neutral, uh, what's ours, uh, and what's natural threats, if you will. So uh, the debris that may be up there. This, it goes beyond just keeping track of it. It goes to trying to determine intent of the person who put their particular satellite in orbit, which means you need to start developing that that picture before they launch. And you need to try to penetrate their systems and and understand what the design of the satellite is before it goes up and what its intent is. And failing that, you need capabilities in the domain that can surveil their satellites. And as we did in the Cold War, in the air domain, get photographs of them, any kind of resource to collect on them once they're deployed, and then hand it over to the really smart engineers at uh, NASIC who can uh, then kind of reverse engineer or take what they see and estimate what the capabilities of the satellites are, and then ultimately use the intelligence analysis to determine their intent. Are they friendly? Are they just a communication satellite? Do they have other satellites attached to them that can attack our satellites? You know, so are they multi-purpose? Are they purely offensive satellites? We've seen the Russians bring satellites up very close to some, some of our sensitive resources in space. This has been openly reported and we don't know their intent, but I suspect it's not good. And you would like to know, is that a weapon? And it's a, as it approaches, what are you going to do about it? So it all begins, it, it begins actually on the ground and trying to understand what's going to be launched in the space before it gets there. And then you have to surveil in the domain. And then ultimately, you're trying to develop an intelligence picture for the commander of U.S. Space Command and for the president of what is what are China and Russia intending to do up there? And I would take it one step further. When you're in the air domain, you worry about surface terror missiles, which come from the land domain. So part of space domain awareness is understanding terrestrial and maritime threats that could attack your satellites. So we also should be building a picture of that threat base. Whenever I flew a practice mission uh, in, in uh, tactical aircraft, we would put on our map threat rings for 
you know, imagine surface to air missile sites that we would have to avoid or do certain tactics when we went through. We should know exactly where all this, the terrestrial and seaborne threats are that can launch direct ascent ASATs to strike our forces so that we know when our satellites are, are in the threat envelope, which heightens the time period you're going to be watching and uh, for nefarious behavior. All of this, and I've kind of hopped around here, but you got to put all of this together to get the, the domain awareness you need for space. And it's and if you look at the demands that uh, soldiers, sailors, and airmen, Marines put on in their particular domains of operations, it's directly analogous to what we need in space. So you, you can start there and ask the questions there and then just roll it in to the requirements to have good space domain awareness. Sir, do you see the intelligence community through groups like the NRO playing a major role in supporting the Space Force, or do you think the Space Force should look to grow its own intelligence capabilities? Uh, this is obviously a hot-button issue in many, many circles. Well, I, you know, the NRO does have a charter to help support the Department of Defense, They're, but their their primary focus is national intelligence. And the same with the NSA and all the national intelligence agencies. And they, they do a great job of supporting the Department of Defense. So I, I don't want to leave an impression that I, I don't think they do their very best. But they also have other requirements they're trying to meet that oftentimes can trump a COCOM's requirement for collection because they are national. You know, they are serving the president and they are serving the, the national security intelligence agencies that, that have to see the big picture, if you will. But beyond the big picture, the other thing that uh, the NRO can do is they can bring exquisite reconnaissance from space. But oftentimes, the uh, combatant commander doesn't need exquisite reconnaissance to do their mission. And exquisite reconnaissance usually means you don't have a lot of those assets because they're so expensive. They're, they're really high tech. So I'm thinking going forward is we, we have had this and continue to have an insatiable demand signal from the regional combatant commanders, not only for um, ISR, so intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance in their domains and their areas of operations, but they want it nearly continuously. They really don't like the gaps in coverage. So um, commercial, the commercial industry has demonstrated that there's a future here. And we already have commercial satellites up there taking pictures of the earth. They're not the same level of resolution that you can get from our highly classified capabilities. But by golly, they're good enough to, for example, help the Ukrainians out in their conflict today. Uh, the issue is um, they're commercial, and it's great that uh, they're willing to do that. But just as we do with the uh, civilian reserve air fleet, the CRAF, you know, in time of crisis, we the airlines put forward their airplanes to help transport our men and women, our Department of Defense men and women around the world. But we don't rely on them 100%. We still have our mobility command. And so I think there's a, a, an analogy there for space. I think uh, space, the Space Force can organize, train, and equip um, ISR capabilities. They can also contract with commercial industry to augment that, and then also use the national assets that the NRO brings. And perhaps, well, not even perhaps, I think there's a, a real possibility we can get out there and, and start really meeting the needs that the COCOMs have been demanding all along. And that's so that they can have almost an unblinking eye in their, in their area of responsibility, uh, all weather. And I think the Space Force has a role to play in that. I think they should provide those capabilities uh, to U.S. Space Command and then U.S. Space Command and its supporting role when it's not being supported, it, when it is supporting say the Indo-PACOM commander could uh, not only provide GPS, over the horizon comms, missile warning, but also ISR at the operational levels that uh, the commander requires. So sir, what does this mean from a training perspective? Uh, how do we build guardians and other space warfighters who are prepared for this new reality? Well, if you're stepping back and talking about it being a combat domain, we weren't allowed to do that before the, like I said, the last year of President Obama's administration. And then there was a bit of a pause there as we contemplated a Space Force or not, but now we have one. And if, if all the Space Force does is what it was doing before it separated from the Air Force, then I'm not sure why we did it. The Space Force will continue to do what it did when it was part of the United States Air Force and the embodiment of Air Force Space Command, 
which is to be an incredible enabler of other domains operations by bringing them the capabilities we've been talking about. But now that uh, they're cleared to think and, and operate like they're in a warfighting domain, which they are in now, they need to develop a whole new set of capabilities and that and people to operate those capabilities and people to think in the way uh, warfighters think. And by that, I mean in the intelligence community and in the command community, the commanders on how what they need to be offensive as well as defensive, because both of those will require new activities. Uh, they're not just going to put up you know, stronger satellites that can resist attack. They're going to have to do a lot of analysis and make command decisions on whether they're going to maneuver or not, or whether they're going to have capabilities up there they can employ against a threat coming at a uh, highly valued satellite, or whether what they're going to how they're going to maneuver and use offensive capability against an adversary's constellations. We haven't had an opportunity to do that, which is why I think it's such an exciting time to be in the space force, frankly, because it's a, a there's a huge demand signal for this. And I'm encouraged by talking to General Raymond when he tells me he's getting 14 applicants for every position uh, that is open in the, his command, which means he's he can be very selective about the quality he's bringing in and the talent he's bringing in. And, and we need all kinds of uh, highly talented people to do this type of work. Well, sir, are there models you'd like to copy that uh, we see here on Earth? I mean, red flag sounds like something we might want to expand for a space focus. Absolutely, Slick. And again, we can open up the books and other domains and see how they do it. First of all, at the individual level, uh, we have never had, we've never fielded simulators, even with the systems that we were operating today for the guardians who operate the GPS constellation, for example, at least when I was in command, they were learning on the actual equipment that they were operating the satellite with. That That's totally unsatisfactory. I mean, in any aircraft that you're going to fly in the Air Force, you're going to do various levels of fidelity simulation before you even get in the airplane. And then you're going to come back to the simulator to keep your skills sharp because there's never enough flying time uh, to stay as sharp as you'd like to be. That's where you do off nominal or emergency procedures, or you practice what are you going to do if somebody attacks you. Uh, You don't do it on the real spaceship. You don't have the resources, the time, the energy, or the fuel to do that. So you need simulators. And the simulators need to train the individual. Then they need to train the team. And then they need to train the command and control elements that's going to give them orders. So there's simulation at every level that, frankly, is not, if it it either doesn't exist or is not robust enough, at least that's a decade ago. And I'm assuming that's another area we got to accelerate in. Even at the command and control level, one thing that always frustrated me is that we had one operations center at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Well, they were operating every day. That's the thing in space. You don't get to practice, which meant, you know, anytime someone wanted space to be integrated into an exercise, the very people using the very equipment that were operating day in and day out were expected to somehow support a COCOM, another COCOM's exercise. Or if you wanted to do an experiment or practice some kind of scenario, we just didn't have the resources. So that's why I say not only at the the small group level, squadron level, Uh, or the Delta level, you need to go all the way up to the command and control level. And we need more than one command and control site, if for no other reason as a, as a coop location in the event, you know, the power goes out of one, you can transfer command to the other one, but certainly so that you can really get space integrated into the broader fight at the operational level. You need to be able to practice that in a separate facility with a separate group of people. And, and then you, that's the place you train the people that actually do the work in the command control center. We did this in Air Combat Command all the time. We had these exercises called EFX. And you'd go to Nellis and there would be a, an air operations center all set up and manned. And you did a war game and you did live fly as part of that. We didn't use the one over in Qatar. <laughs> at LUD. Those guys are actually operating. They don't have time to practice or exercise. But that's how I got trained to run an AOC. And that's how my team got trained at 8th Air Force when we were there. And uh, that's how we sharpened our skills as planners and commanders and executors of the daily uh, air operations. Uh, we need that same thing in space. 
And then again, so let's look around to what else. Uh, and I'll use the air domain since I'm most familiar, but you'll see this in the army as well out of Fort Irwin. Where do you bring together everybody in an exercise fashion like red flag? Okay. So red flag brings in units. The original idea was you got your, your first 10 combat sorties before you went to combat. And so you tried to make red flag as realistic as possible. And as a, a young lieutenant or captain flying the F-15, you went there, there was those threat ranges that you had to do live fly against. There was adversary aircraft who mimicked the tactics of uh, our adversaries at the time. It was the Soviets in the Cold War for me. And uh, they were expert at flying like the Soviets flew. And they flew airplanes with similar capabilities. And you'd go in there and you'd fight these guys in a simulated, a live but simulated environment, and then come back and do debriefs and learn. And, you, you know, your very first time in there, you were so nervous, your first flight. And by the 10th flight, you were getting comfortable and, and you, were, you were so steep on the learning curve. Uh, I mean, you were just accelerating up the learning curve that now you return to your home unit, continued honing those skills. And that prepared you for the day if the flag ever went up, if the balloon ever went up and we had to go to war. Uh, we need something similar. And I'm not sure what exactly that looks like, but you need to be able to take our guardians off the consoles that they're operating today and put them in an environment someplace with realistic threats, a thinking adversary. So other guardians who take the time to pretend like they're Chinese or Russian space operators who are trying to interrupt, jam, destroy, mitigate the capabilities of our constellations, and they fight in the simulated environment. And uh, that uh, will make us so much more prepared for uh, a bad day if it comes. But even more importantly, if the Chinese and the Russians see us doing this, they may be less likely to cross that threshold. Well, sir, how do you think we need to update our technological capabilities? I mean, it sounds like we need both offensive and defensive systems. Yes. I'm, I'm, if I haven't made that clear, so like that's exactly right. And, you know, there's all different kinds of ways to preserve the capabilities you have on orbit. You know, you can make them less predictable where they are. You can make them maneuverable so they can move around the way of satellites. Again, I'll go back to the air domain. How do we, how do we avoid a threat in the air domain? Well, you, you have to first acquire the threat. You have to know you're being threatened. If you can see it, perhaps you can maneuver out of the way. Okay, now in space, that's a very expensive thing to do because fuel is typically a limiting factor on the life of a satellite. You don't want to waste fuel. But if it's, it's what you need to do to stay alive, you sh certainly should have enough fuel to make that maneuver on board and the appropriate thrust on the space vehicle to do that, if that's your tactic. In the air domain, uh, an infrared missile is coming at you, you put out a flare to help defend and you maneuver. You do more than one thing. If it's a radar missile, you put out chaff and you maneuver. I mean, you, there's there's a lot of things you can do there, uh, but, it, but you have to think about it and decide how you're going to do it. And then you got to train how you're going to employ that in real time. Or you maybe have automatic systems on board. Maybe the vehicle knows it's under attack and without a human intervention, it begins to take, make maneuvers or deploy countermeasures is what you'd call chaff and flares in the air domain, how, whatever those countermeasures may be in space. Um, you can also make it difficult by having the satellites moving around in, in random order for anybody to target them because they expect it to come over the horizon at such and such a time and such and such a position, but it doesn't. So they have to delay their shot for another, or, another 90 minutes while you go around. And these types of things add fog of war to the, the fight in space. So, I, you know, I, there's lots of other things. I probably haven't talked about all of them. But again, I go back to the other domains and say, what do they use? What does the Army use? They put smoke out. They obscure the, the adversary's ability to see their tanks. Uh, they, they have other countermeasures that they, they use on their battlefield for defensive measures. But they don't send tanks into combat without guns. <laughs> and they don't send soldiers into combat just with body armor you have to have the offensive capability as well to be effective. So you need both. Sir, how does command and control fit into this? I'd imagine we need to enhance capabilities and practices. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the commander of U.S. Space Command is going to be the commander of operations in space. Uh, he, may, he may even be the supported combatant commander, depending on the phase of the fight and what's going on. Um, but certainly he'll be a supporting combatant commander, of if it's China, the Indo-PACOM commander, if it's Russia, the UCOM commander. And 
they need to be able to practice that command and control element, that ability, how they're going to set their battle rhythm, how they're going to communicate what they need, what support they need uh, at the strategic level, at the combatant commander level. And then that flows down to the operational level, whether it's in a, a talk for the Army or an AOC for the Air Force or, or the SPOC for the Space Force that are the services that are providing the capabilities to the COCOMs, their component commanders, they're going to have to also be integrated into training scenarios and practice how they're going to do this. And uh, if, if you don't practice it, you're behind. You're behind on day one. And uh, you, you not only sharpen your ability to execute the plans you have today, you find that in these type of scenarios, which are exercises or war games, you develop new tactics, techniques, and procedures that enhance your abilities, your capabilities, and maybe fill in for shortfalls in hardware that you don't have quite fielded yet. Okay, sir, here's one for you. What about organizational relationships? In the past, space was always viewed as a supporting domain to empower actions on Earth. Does that change now? I mean, I could see a time when a bomber strikes a terrestrial threat that is impacting a space asset, and that's really air supporting space. And we really don't think like that. Right, and we should. It's like we should. I mean, because we do in every other domain. I mean, we use A-10s to support the Army, right? That's cross-domain. That's air power enabling land operations. Uh, We use B-52 to mine harbors. That's air power supporting naval operations. They can also deliver uh, air-to-surface anti-ship weapons. We operate cross-domain all the time. Patriot operates cross-domain into the air domain, right, from the land against our adversaries. And so we shouldn't be thinking any differently in space. I believe U.S. Space Command should demand support from the other services to help them with their mission. And their mission is to, you know, first preserve the capabilities we have up there to enable everybody else, but also to defeat uh, adversary space capabilities. Should we, they be directed to do that. And from the defensive side, yes, we, we ought to be demanding that uh, our air, land and sea forces develop capabilities and tactics, techniques, and procedures to hold at risk things that will hold our space capabilities at risk. And vice versa. In the vice versa area, I, you know, I, the mind can imagine a lot of things, but it's, I don't think that'll happen immediately. But you can uh, actually imagine perhaps someday in the future where the, uh, the space domain will deliver capabilities and support beyond the enablement capabilities we do. But I'm talking about offensive capabilities cross domain into the air, land, or sea domains. And one last thing, uh, this notion of being able to uh, hold our adversaries' assets at risk in space, their satellites at risk. There should be a demand function there for the Air Force, for the Army, and for the Navy to develop capabilities that can do just that in support of the U.S. Space Command mission. All right, sir, let's take it back up to the big picture. What does it mean to deter aggressors in space, given what we see today? And how does what you've just described fit into this? Yeah, so I I don't think deterrence changes as a function of domain. And, and, you know, the fundamentals of deterrence, so you're trying to influence an adversary's decision, typically not to do something that, that is disadvantageous or harmful to you. And the way we classically try to influence them is by demonstrating capabilities and the wills to use them that will either inflict unacceptable punishment if they make the wrong decision or deny them the benefit that they seek by making the wrong decision. So this is where I, I go back to the, our very beginning discussion. Um, you have to ask, and, and every adversary is different. And one of the great mistakes we make uh, is we mirror image our adversaries. We think that they value and fear the same things we do. And I, I do not believe that. And, it, and it's not easy work to figure out what they value and fear. And sometimes we can't precisely determine that. So you have to hold more things at risk than to make sure you cover the waterfront. But you have to have one key question, I think, vis-a-vis the Chinese is, are they willing to be punished to take out our space capabilities if they believe that in doing so, that will ensure victory? Uh, and the answer to that may be absolutely. I mean, look, at, look how much punishment Russia is taking right now in the Ukraine. Russia was clearly undeterred in their invasion of the Ukraine, or else they wouldn't have gone in. Uh, and we are inflicting, or the Ukrainians are inflicting combat punishment on them. The rest of the world is inflicting diplomatic and uh, economic punishment upon them, but they're not stopping. 
So you have to consider you know, how, how serious are they about accomplishing that and how much punishment are they willing to accept? And I think in the case, personally, in the case of Taiwan, I think the Chinese are willing to accept a lot of punishment. I think the regime hangs on the promise that one day Taiwan will be uh, taken over by the mainland. So you have to turn to the other leg of deterrence, which is denial of objective, which is why I think it's so critical to field offensive capabilities. So here's my, here's my nightmare scenario. Uh, the nightmare scenario would be we don't field any offensive capabilities, and the Chinese do, obviously have, and uh, they attack and eliminate all of our space-based ISR capability, and they attack through jamming or direct ascent, our GPS capability, and they take out our over-horizon communication satellites and missile warning satellites that uh, warn us of missile launches over the Western Pacific. But they retain all of theirs. Their bait-out constellation is healthy. That's their GPS equivalent. Their over-the-horizon communications are healthy. And most importantly, their multiple ISR satellites, which were designed to track our naval forces, detect and track our naval forces, are totally uninjured and can do that job. We don't want to fight that fight. But if the alternative is to them, that if they do that to us, we eliminated all theirs and it's a level playing field, we'll win. In the former case, um, I don't know if we'll win, but I'm certain there'll be a lot of sailors that won't come home from that scenario and airmen. Uh, and so I think my view is that to deter the Putins and the Xi's of the world, you cannot do that from a purely defensive posture. You must hold their capabilities at risk as well. And you must show the will to, to attack them should they cross the line. Now, some people listening to this might counter that we are only going to accelerate an arms race uh, in space and that we should be better off not pursuing these capabilities. What's your response to that? And what approach makes space safer? Well, the arms race started. <laughs> we haven't even put our track shoes on. They're, they're out lapping us and, and, and we have yet to move out. So we always forget that the adversary gets a vote here and they voted. They're fielding offensive capabilities. So, I mean, if, if there's going to be an arms race, I want to at least be on the track running. I'd like to be out in front. But uh, I, I don't buy that at all. There, I, I forget who said it during the Cold War, but they said when, when we build up, the Russians build up. When we decrease, the Russians build up. I mean, they, the Soviets, actually, at the time. I mean, this notion that bad people will follow our lead, I don't buy. That It's an idealistic view. I admire people who have this view. But I don't see anything in history that shows that, they, that people like Putin and Xi will tend in this direction. So by saying, well, if the, the best course of action is to do nothing because then maybe they won't you know, build weapons. Uh, well, we, we know that's a failed hypothesis right now because we have done nothing and they have built weapons. And, and so now we have no choice but to act. And whether or not we're in an arms race or not is, is a different matter, actually. And that, that gets into the point of how much you field after you field the capability. I mean, we're not in an arms race with tanks. <laughs> not in an arms race with ships, not in an arms race with airplanes, but we've fielded enough that we think is capable to do the national security missions that we think we need airplanes, tanks, and ships for. So you don't, you don't necessarily end up in a race just because you finish build offensive capability. You still make prudent judgments on what your force structure looks like, regardless of the adversaries. Okay, we are obviously late to the game on implementing these changes. What do you think a realistic time frame is to make this happen? And what could help move it along faster? Slick, first of all, let me say that um, we may not be behind because listen, I, all I know is what I read in the paper and all I know is what I hear our leadership say in the open press. And uh, we have a history of doing things behind closed doors in this country that uh, is pretty dramatic. The development of stealth aircraft is one example some of our submarine capabilities that, you know, the adversaries didn't discover until after we had uh, fielded them have been pretty eye watering as well. So I, I would hope we are doing some of these things and we just don't know about it. Now there's a problem with that. You can't deter somebody unless they know the capabilities that you have. So if we are doing this type of thing, at some point we need to make sure 
both uh, China and Russia know that to some level that we have this capability. A good example of that is the uh, GSAP constellation. I mean, that was fielded. It was uh, very hush-hush and no one talked about it. And it was General Shelton, who was commander of Air Force Space Command at the time, who, who argued for and, and got the approval to make that capability known. And it was, a, you know, it was a space situational awareness capability at the geosynchronous altitude where we suspected uh, China and Russia were conducting operations against our satellites. And we had no way of really detecting them without having satellites up in that uh, in that orbit that could look around and fly around and see what what the, they were doing with these satellites, their satellites. And that is a deterrent because they now know we're watching they don't believe you're watching and they don't believe you can attribute, then they kind of feel free to do whatever they want. So it's a great example of developing a capability, kind of keeping it under wraps for a while and then revealing it and then having an effect because you've done that. That is the effect you want to achieve, which is to give them pause about their freedom of operation for nefarious purposes in that domain. So I, I always want to begin by saying, I only know what I know. And it's uh, none of that's classified what I know, but how long do we, will it take? I don't know the answer to that either. Uh, however, uh, I know it's something we can do. You know, when you talk about weapons in space and people would always argue against having them back when I was in the service, I would ask them, well, do you think if we developed a satellite that could fly up next to another country's satellite and we put a robotic arm on that satellite and uh, it could reach out and either grab or uh, disturb or, or damage that other country's satellite, would you call that a weapon in space? And I've never had anybody answer that other than yes. And then I would remind him that I flew in one of those vehicles called the space shuttle. <laughs> and no one ever accused me of being flying a weapon. So we know how to do this stuff. Uh, we know how to do it very well. And it's just a matter of uh, getting the requirements right for the mission set and moving out rapidly, which we are getting better and better as a country in rapidly developing capabilities, uh, particularly in the space domain, thanks to, uh, I think, a lot in a large part to the commercial industry and uh, some of the innovative things that they're doing with small and medium-sized satellites with space launch, et cetera. And so um, it won't get done quickly, though, if we don't make it a priority. And I think it needs to be made a priority. I think we can also take lessons from what's going on in the Ukraine today. The Chinese are watching. They're watching for sure what we're doing and how we're responding. And they're watching to see how successful Mr. Putin is with his uh, illegal and uh, dastardly operations in the Ukraine. And uh, people have talked about when one might think that China would consider a um, offensive operation against Taiwan year of various time frames. I think the time frame is shortened. I think we're seeing that the Chinese move in a direction of developing coercive capabilities, both in a nuclear area, in the space area, and they're looking for opportunities not only to make it more difficult for us to operate in the Western Pacific with their anti-access strategies, but they're also looking to intimidate us, looking for ways that they can intimidate us. And uh, they're watching us being, in some regards, intimidated in Eastern Europe right now. Add that to uh, how we pulled out of Afghanistan. And my sense is uh, our timeline is probably shorter than we think. And so I think a sense of urgency is absolutely required at this time. And I, I don't think that's alarmist, frankly. All right, sir. Asking you to look in your crystal ball here. In 10 years, what sort of national security space enterprise would you like to see us field? Well, you know, I've talked a lot about where I think uh, the Space Force and U.S. Space Command and all the other services and their support supporting roles for the space domain needs to be. And I, and I think, uh, I, you know, I'd like to see that all mature. <laughs> I'd like to see that mature into the domain being treated very much the way the other domains are treated, both in the way we organize, train, and equip and operate in that domain. And then, uh, and plan for, uh, plan for the fights in that domain. But when I talk about when I think about national security space, I think about U.S. leadership as well. I often would ask audiences, you know, um, anybody think that we'll have that there'll be another human on the moon before 2030? And uh, this was, you know, even 10 years ago. And most people would say, yeah, sure, we'll be back. Somebody would be standing on. I said, well, does it matter if that somebody plants a Chinese flag or an American flag? 
And I think it does. Uh, I think it's about national leadership, and which then turns into alignment in the world. We're seeing in spades what happens when you're when you do things that are bad, and everybody thinks they're bad. You see unity against that entity, and that's what we're seeing at the world unifying in their opposition with some exceptions to include China uh, against Russians activity in Ukraine, but there can be another side of that coin. And that's where you, they see a country doing great things. And they say, you know what, when it comes to economic relations, when it comes to diplomatic relations, when it comes to military relations, I want to be friendly with that country. Uh, they're not only good guys, they're doing great things. I want to align with them and not with someone with an alternative view of how the world should be. And, and so I think even our, our great things we do with robotic and human exploration of the solar system, the return to the moon, onto Mars, the things that JPL does and will continue to do to expand our knowledge of the solar system shows leadership. And it shows, and, and, and people want to be led and they want to be on a team that's doing great things. And so when I think of national security in the space domain, I go beyond the Department of Defense. And I think in a holistic manner of how the United States sh should continue to strive to be the leaders in this domain, not only in national security, defensive operations, but in, in, uh, in things that the whole world is interested in doing and is awed by when we successfully do them. Sir, thank you so much for your time today. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Hey, Slick, it was my pleasure. I always appreciate the opportunity to be uh, on your podcast. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.